So without further ado, I would like to call Stacy up to talk with everybody. Yes. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you all. Thank you for the intro, and thank you for having me here, and everyone for coming out tonight. I know everyone's busy, so thank you for taking the time. Um, how's everyone doing today? It's cold outside. <laughs> right? We're in California. It's not supposed to be this cold, right? <laughs> but it is, so... What are we going to do about it? Go see it. <laughs> anyway, so tonight I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my journey um, over the past three years, um, starting my social cloud with my brother all the way to our acquisition, and then I'm hoping since we have a smaller group that we can do some Q&A and, and also answer some questions and um, hopefully give some advice or some help with everything that everyone's working on and kind of do a collaborative thing here at the end. Um, so yeah, just to, just to start off my story, um, I really got into entrepreneurship when I was in high school. Um, I had previously gone in middle school to a public middle school in Phoenix, Arizona, where I grew up. Um, and when it was time to go to high school, my parents gave me the choice to either continue going on to the public school, the public high school where I grew up, or to go on to a private all-girls school. And my parents... Uh, didn't tell me you have to go to this private school. Instead, they encouraged me, saying, um, you know, you should do what challenge, challenges you. And so I decided for high school that I would go on to this, um, this all-girls Catholic private high school in Phoenix. Um, and for the first two years there, I didn't really identify with anyone or have any of the friends that they had all had growing up together. Um, and during that period of time, while I was still trying to find myself in this new high school, um, my brother had been playing online computer games. And I had gone into his room and seen him play these games, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. I want to be able to play these games too. And so he sat me down one night and was showing me all the games that he was playing, and, and we started playing the games together and help each, helping each other out. And then one day, we were talking about it, and we said, why don't we create our own game? Why don't we create an online game where the world is ours and we can determine the economy and everything like that? And we said, okay, we can, we can seriously do this, but how do we do this? And so the first thing was learning how to program. So I went back to my all-girls school and I, and I said, I want to learn how to program. I want to create an online computer game. And they came back to me and said, well, we only offer one programming class for girls, so you can take our basic HTML class. And so I took that. And after that was done, I said, okay, cool, I want another class. What's the next thing that I can do to learn? Because I can't code a computer game in HTML. Um, and they came back to me and said, well, we don't have any other classes for girls here, but if you were to go over to the boys' school, they have a ton of classes that you could take. And right then and there, I wasn't okay with that. I said, my brother's getting the education and getting all these things that I want over at that school, but here you only offer one of those classes. And they said, well, simply girls aren't interested in it. And so girls won't enroll in those classes. And that wasn't acceptable for me. So I said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to learn on my own. And so after school, I would go back home and I would sit down at the computer and I would document all the things that I was doing, learning CSS and JavaScript to start, um, and started collaborating with my brother and building these little projects. And then finally, once I graduated high school, my parents came to my brother and I and said, it's time for you guys to go get real jobs and internships out in the real world and start making some money before you go off to college. And my brother and I kind of sat in, in our rooms one night and we were talking to each other saying, you know, mom and dad really want us to go out and get internships, but we've been building all these things um, and learning how to program, so why don't we ask them to take the summer to do something with that? Um, and so we went to our parents and we said, we've been learning how to program, and now we want to do this. Because doing is better than thinking, and so we want to go out and we want to learn this, uh, we want to build something with the skills that we've learned. And so our parents came back to us and said, all right, so you want to build something, that's fine, but entrepreneurs don't make money. So how are you going to support yourselves building this, building whatever you want to build over the summer? And we said, we don't know, what, but we'll figure it out. And they came back to us and said, all right, then you can figure it out. Financially, completely on your own, you can go do this if you want to do it rather than getting an internship. 
So my brother and I were talking about it again, and we said, you know, we have $4,000 saved up from birthday money and everything that we had had, so uh, we'll take that money and we'll go do this. And so my brother was attending University of Southern California um, the next fall, and so we decided that we would move to Los Angeles and start our business. So we moved to this apartment in South Central Los Angeles, which, as I'm hearing from the left, you know that that's not the best place that you want to really live. But it was next to USC, which meant it was next to good talent, and it was really cheap rent in a place like this. Um, and so we got a, a 500 square foot apartment with two bedrooms and rented out one of the rooms to another USC kids that we could afford to live there for the summer. Um, we blew up our air mattresses and away we started um, building the product that summer. And at first, even though we had been learning how to program, um, our product started like this. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, how do I get started? And the biggest thing for me that I always say is start with a pen and paper. Start writing out your ideas. Start documenting what you want if you're building a web product. What is every site gonna, every page on the site going to look like? What are all the buttons going to link to? Um, so our project started like this. And gradually over the summer, we were translating everything that we had drawn out on paper onto our actual web product and building it online. Um, and as we were doing that that summer, I saw a tweet from Richard Branson, which I know his name's been mentioned a couple times tonight, but how many of you know who he is? Some of you. OK, so for just in case people don't, um, he started the Virgin brand. So um, there are over 400 companies under Virgin now, things like Virgin Airlines and Virgin Mobile and Virgin Records, um, and a well-known entrepreneur. And I saw this tweet that said, enjoy intimate cocktails plus two parties with me in Miami, $2,000 to charity, and then you can see the tweet above it gives an email address. So I saw this come through my feed, and immediately I took that email address, and I said, I am not old enough to legally drink in the United States, but my brother and I have looked up to you as someone who's an established entrepreneur, and we would love to fly to Miami to meet you. So we got an email back later that night from his secretary, and she said, if you can donate $4,000 and be in Miami in 48 hours, then you can meet him. And my brother and I, being, again, the broke college kids who are living in South Central Los Angeles, with $4,000, mind you, for the entire summer, um, we're sitting on our air mattresses saying, where are we going to get this money? Um, and so we did the only thing that two kids our age with a 48-hour time limit could do, which is call up mom and dad. <laughs> and we said, hey, so we know that we're supposed to be financially independent for this summer, but there's a really good opportunity to go meet Richard Branson in Miami. And over the phone, I could hear my dad's hesitation and him saying, how did you find out about this opportunity? And I said, well, Twitter. <laughs> and he came back to me and he said, first of all, what's Twitter? <laughs> and second of all, are you sure it's not a scam? And so I explained to him what Twitter was. You know, people tweet and they send out these little tidbits of information. And it's not a scam because Richard Branson has a little check mark next to his name, so he's legit. Um, so I said, could we please borrow $4,000 so that we could go meet him? And my dad came back to us and said, um, you know, something that we'd grown up with our entire life, which is you work for what you get. So he said, you need to put together a proposal for me. Why do you need this money? Where is the money going? Most importantly, how are you going to pay me back? And so my brother and I stayed up all night, admittedly a little bit mad at our dad, saying, you know, we've got 24 hours to do this. Why is he making us write this proposal? Um, we just need to get this money and go. Um, but we stayed up all night writing the proposal, and we sent it to him, and he called us back in the morning, and he said, I think you kids are crazy, mm -hmm. but this will be a lesson for you in money management. I will loan you the $4,000 with the one expectation that you have to pay me back in three months before you go back to college next fall. So my brother and I kind of discussed it, and we said, you know what? That's a lot of money to repay if we have to repay it, but um, 
but Dad's a forgiving guy. So, <laughs> so we'll take the money and we'll go. <laughs> and so we took the money and we flew to Miami um, for two nights for a good opportunity, but also taking a little bit of that risk there. And the two nights in Miami were parties, as the tweet suggested. Um, but the first night was a party of 18 people in a room with Richard Branson. Um, and in the room, which was probably half the size of this room, and chairs around just like they are now, everyone went around the room and talked about the projects that they were working on and the things that they were passionate about. Um, and I guess, you know, where you sit meant everything in this situation where my brother and I were sitting right next to the door. So right when Branson came in, we said hello. And then we were the last people to talk about our project. And right after we were in that room, we immediately went up to him and said, we would love to get your contact details and keep you updated on the progress of what we're working on. Um, and so Branson said, sure, um, give me a piece of paper and I'll write down my, my contact details. And so we handed him a paper and he wrote it down. And afterwards, uh, I'll never forget my brother going over to his secretary saying, is this really his email address? And her saying, <laughs> Yeah, keep it close. <laughs> um, and so with that, we were more motivated than ever to work on our business. And so when we flew back to Los Angeles, um, we put the finishing touches on the project that we had already been working on so far, which was a website that allowed people to store their usernames and passwords for everything online and having one username and password to log into everything. And so the site, at its very beginning stage, looked like this. A simple site with... Um, all the little buttons for all the other sites that people would store their usernames and passwords to and simply when you would click on one it would turn around and show you the username and password. So we sent that as an MVP over to Branson and said, can you tell us what you think? Um, can you give us some advice on this? What are things that you think should be improved? And he came back to us and he said, um, I think this is great what you have so far and let me introduce you to my friend Jerry Murdoch. Um, now Jerry co-founded something called Insight Venture Partners, which is a venture capital firm, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and we started emailing back and forth with Jerry about our product. And about a week later, he decided he wanted to fly out to meet us. And so he flew out to LA and for an entire day drilled us on everything you could ever be drilled on about your business. Um, what's your revenue model? Uh, you know, How many people are on your team? What's the equity look like now? Um, and most importantly for us at the time, which is, if I were to make an investment in your company, are you going to go on to college or not? And so my brother and I answered all of these questions and um, went out to dinner with Jerry later that night and he said, here's the deal, Branson and I will both invest dollar for dollar, a million dollars into my social cloud. Um, and that kind of kick-started what we were doing um, that summer. So with that million dollars, we decided to upgrade our living standards a little bit. <laughs> we moved into this apartment in Los Angeles still, um, but it was a little bit bigger so that we could hire a little more of a team, and you can still see the, the air mattresses there, and the light truss from an Amazon purchase my brother had in college that was our closet. Um, and so we moved into this apartment and uh, started working even more on product and hiring a couple new people um, we had, at this point, a chief technology officer who we brought on as a co-founder um, who had his master's in security from USC, um, who then helped us make a couple more hires after that. Um, and as, our, as we started really working on the next phases of our product, my parents came back to my brother and I and they said, all right, we know that you had this little deal with Branson and Jerry, but you're our only two kids and one of you has to go to college. We're not going to have two kids that don't get a college degree. Um, and so myself, being the youngest who hadn't had any years of college, um, went on to NYU for a year. Um, and while I was there, um, in my dorm room, I spent most of my time working on the business um, while also taking classes. And during that year, which was probably the busiest year of my life, um, we had a couple things in product um, where we started making decisions, big decisions for my social cloud. Um, 
we were getting a lot of feedback from our users and our customers saying certain things like, you know, we really love what you have so far, but you should start building out these other features for us. One of those being, as you can see here, bookmarks. Um, so we had a lot of our users come back saying, uh, we're using your, your site to store usernames and passwords, but, you know, we're also storing websites that don't have usernames and passwords associated for it, so you should just build us a feature that allows us to store those in not the username context. And so we spent a lot of engineering time and talent and energy thinking about how to build this product and actually building it out. Um, and as we started doing that, we also learned the lesson of looking at your data as a tech company. And so we started looking at the data, realizing we were getting a lot of feedback from users saying they wanted bookmarks, yet looking at the numbers, not a lot of people were using it. Actually, only something like 10% of our user base was using the bookmarking portion that we had spent probably 70% of our time building out this platform. So as we were looking at it, uh, we kind of had this moment as a team where it's like, do you go down this road of bookmarking because you have users that are super passionate about it, or do you stay true to your focus as a company, which is names and passwords and why we started the company in the beginning. Um, and of course we decided, you know, stay true to the focus, use names and passwords. But we had seen this as a miniature failure. And as we were reflecting on this, why we had spent all this engineering time and this talent and this energy and uh, everything just building out this part of the product, uh, we were sitting there saying, you know, how did this happen? How did we spend so much time on something that in our company is ultimately a failure? Um, but as we were reflecting on it, I learned probably one of the most important lessons that I've ever learned in my life, uh, which is a quote that I'll share with you, which is that failure depends on your expectation of learning. And to me that means that in the time that you spend learning things, as long as you're actually reflecting and learning on them, you're not failing. In fact, for us, it was a point in our company where we were making these decisions and we hadn't really gone back and taken the time to reflect on why we were making the decisions. So we had just kept building things. But in learning this lesson, I learned how to learn and what, what to learn about. Um, and so we knew that we would never make those same mistakes again later on down the line. And so as we had some of these miniature failures within the company, and I was spending all this time reflecting because of that quote, I realized that probably part of the reason that we weren't spending so much time going back and reflecting on things and asking why or why not was because my time as a founder wasn't 100% dedicated to my social cloud, and that I was splitting my time between university and running the business, and therefore I didn't feel like I had time to go back to the team and ask, you know, why are we doing this or why aren't we doing this? Um, and I wasn't even taking the time myself to ask these questions. And so after one year of college, I went back to my parents and had a talk with them and said, I know you really want me to finish college, but for the company and for myself, I need to take time off. And so I signed my leave of absence paperwork after one year, and I moved back to Los Angeles to work 100% on my social cloud with the rest of the team. And as we were working there, um, we went back and we focused just on usernames and passwords. We got back to the core and everything that wasn't revolving around how to store your usernames and passwords and how to make that process of logging in online easier, we completely ripped out of the product, which ultimately doesn't make your team feel so great when you have to take hours of work that they had just spent and say, we're completely scrapping this because it's not quarter our focus. But we knew that it was something that we had to do to keep surviving as a company and keep being true to our customers. And so we started building out features like the one button login that, again, were just core to our product. Um, and as we started building out these features, we started doing a lot of things around getting press getting people to use our product and getting eyeballs on our product. Um, and at the time, we kind of had a lot of discussions with our investors where, um, I'm not sure if any of you are encountering this, but they didn't necessarily believe in a marketing budget. And so with no marketing budget, what are, what are you supposed to do? 
And so we did things like make spreadsheets of all the places that we thought that we could get free press, all the connections that we had, the universities that we had, the places that we had lived, um, and the different angles that we thought we had as a company and as founders. And so in making this list, we started reaching out to everyone that we could, just cold emailing, cold calling, um, saying, will you please write an article about us? Will you please highlight our, highlight our story or our product? Um, and from that, surprisingly, a lot of people did. And so our product kept growing. And as our product was growing, our team, likewise, had to start growing. Um, and so we started making a lot of hires. And one of the things that you do as you make more hum company hires is that you start trying to learn about company culture and saying, how do we get everyone in the office to get along um, and to like coming into the office every day? How do we make sure that this doesn't turn into a nine to five, people get in the office and then they leave? How do we make sure that they want to be there um, for the long haul and have the nights like we did when we were first starting out, you know, staying up till four in the morning just working on the product because we were so excited about it. And so we started doing fun things, being in Los Angeles, like going to the beach and swimming and playing volleyball to help build that company culture. Um, we did a lot of other things. We were lucky with location and that in our office in Los Angeles, um, the roof was kind of an open terrace, and so we would take our little tents and we'd go sit on the roof and work from the roof that overlooked L.A. Um, and so we would do a lot of these kind of fun things um, that would help build that company culture. Um, and as we were building our product and therefore building our team, we realized that it was time to raise another round of money. Because a million dollars seems like a lot of money, but when you're running a business, I'm getting some head nods. It's not a lot of money. And so um, we decided that it's time to raise our Series A. So we started talking to a lot of different VC groups and a lot of angels that were getting intro to us. Um, and our investors intro us to this man whose name is Michael Furtick. And he came into our office um, December 26th, I guess, of last year, the day after Christmas. And we started talking about our product and where we were going and how much money we needed to raise. And he came back to us and said, I am an angel investor, but I also run a company called Reputation.com. Um, and where you guys are going with your product is a place where I think reputation is paralleling. And so I would love to talk about switching the conversation from you guys raising a Series A to getting acquired by reputation. And so my brother and I, this was the first time we had ever really thought about an acquisition. Um, we had really been building this business for the past two years at that point um, because it was a product that we needed and we loved and we loved building it. But as we started weighing the pros and cons of um, what are some of the good things and bad things about continuing your company on your own and good things and bad things about getting acquired, we realized that as an internet security company, we will always need more money, we will always need more talent, we will always need the best talent. And for all of those things, you always need a good reputation, which is a little ironic because of the name reputation.com, um, but a good reputation and the funds to be able to keep this going. And so after a couple months of thinking about it, um, and weighing all these pros and cons and talking to a lot of people, we got acquired by reputation.com. Um, and my brother and I have been working to integrate my social cloud into the reputation products now, um, into something that they call their consumer data vault, which will be rolled out hopefully in the next year. Um, and so that's kind of my story over the past two years. But I want to leave you all, before we do Q&A, with a quote, which, again, is another quote that I try and live my life by, which is, the world is not as it is. The world is as we make it. And so with that, I hope that all of you go out and create the world that you want to live in and create the products that make that world a better place. So thank you. It's blocking since we have a bit of time, and I think it's always a very valuable to have a Q&A session. Yeah. Is that okay that we open up? Definitely. Yeah. So um, we have about 15 minutes at least. Definitely. So let's do the yeah. jam. Yeah. For sure. Question? So what's next? Yeah. So I, right now, I'm working on 
two sorts of things. A nonprofit um, that helps kids that are 20 and under 20 get started on their own businesses, which is called 2 billion under 20, because there are 2 billion people on earth that are 20 and under 20. Um, and then I also am getting ready to start on my next startup in the ad tech space, so advertising technology. Can you talk about how much uh, you sold the company for? So legally, we're not allowed to. Okay. Um, I wish I could. But Did you pay your parents back at least? <laughs> Definitely pay my parents back. <laughs> right after we got the investment, my parents were like, that $4,000. <laughs> and we were like, all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your personal growth where you know, you're running company and everybody else haven't even had a career themselves, right? Yeah. So sometimes you felt like you're an you don't belong. Definitely. Uh, and you're only girl, perhaps. Yeah. And all that, like how you felt and how you dealt with it. You probably cruised through, but I would love to hear how you felt on the ball. <laughs> so I didn't cruise through. <laughs> there were lots of times, I've been talking to some of you today about the ups and downs and the days that you're in tears. And not only were there days where I was in tears about the company, there were days where I was in tears because I was this you know, 18 and 19 year old girl who wasn't getting the college experience, all my friends were out partying and I was running this business and on calls being yelled at by investors and I was just like, why am I doing this to myself? Like, I should be out having the college experience that everyone else is having um, and it was really tough for me to get over that, um, knowing that my entire life would be changed completely because I started so early and as I'm sure many of you know, as you start doing business and as the emails start rolling in and things like that, you can't go back, right? There's no way I could ever go back, even if I were to go back to college today. It just wouldn't be the same experience that everyone else has. Um, and so that took a while to get over, but I eventually got over it just knowing that my life would be and has been so much more enriched because of the experiences that I've had. And I think that one of the most important things that I learned in running the business was, again, that learning how to learn and knowing what to care about learning about, if that makes sense. And so um, in going to high school and in going to my first year of college, I was doing that mainly to go through the motions of like, everyone my age goes to high school, everyone my age goes to college. Um, I got pretty much straight A's all throughout high school, and again, I ended NYU my freshman year with a 3.8 GPA, and it was just like, you know, I'm getting good grades, and this is what I'm supposed to do, but I didn't really care about the things that I was learning about. I wasn't retaining any of the information. It was just, I'm doing this for a test. And so, when we started the business, I was learning about things I actually wanted to learn, and it created like a fire within me about what it means to be a passionate learner. Um, and I discovered the things that I really wanted to learn about outside of the classroom, um, which are the things that now today I learn about and continue to learn about regardless of my school education. And I think that that's meant all the difference because there was a point in time where I was just you know, reading the books because I had to read the books. And now I want to read the books and I'm constantly wanting to learn more just because I have a passion to do it. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that I learned that school never taught me. I have a good news for you. Women Startup Lab has serious happy hours sometimes, so you can do something <laughs> You'll be invited. Perfect. Are you old enough? Not quite. Definitely. I just started 21. That's good. That's, good. that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here tonight. It's really great to hear your story. Yeah. Yeah, thank um, you. I appreciate that. I'm wondering how you balanced um, keeping your ideas under wraps and also having to share them publicly, making sure no one stole your idea. Yeah, so I guess for the first kind of four months in starting my social cloud, my brother and I were super secretive about it. We didn't tell anyone. Um, and then we kind of hit this point where we realized that, um, I guess we realized two things. The first thing is that most people are already busy with whatever they're doing in life and they can't find time to execute on something. Um, like, 
if they're not as passionate about it as you are, as you're already starting your company, most of the time they won't find the time to go and do it. Because you know it takes a lot of extra effort to go do something, and most people just don't put in the extra effort. Um, and second of all, uh, there will be people that go out there and steal ideas, and we had a little bit of that at my social cloud. Um, but the devil is in the details and in the execution, and we found those people that went and tried to copy our product died extremely fast, just because um, they didn't have the insight or the vision that we had. They didn't have the drive to execute it on, on it like we did. Um, and so while there were moments of panic and these people are doing what we're doing and they're literally copying, and we could see the logs come in and those people log into our site and then we could see the next week that their site had been updated with the thing that we had just pushed. Um, and there were like these moments of panic, but they died really fast after that, just because they relied on us for their next move. Um, so I guess then after we kind of realized that uh, there will be copycats if there's a good idea, um, we just decided, you know, let's just tell everyone, get as much feedback as we can on it, and just make sure that we're always one step ahead of whoever else is out there. Um, and I think that it's a really good idea to keep tabs on your competitors. There are some, I talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs and a lot of them are scared to go and see what their competitors are doing because they're afraid, you know, if I look at it and I'm doing the same sort of thing, then it's, um, it's kind of like this cat and mouse type thing. And I say, go look, see what they're doing and just make sure that you're always one step ahead and you're always doing something better. Um, and there will be copycats, but that's just, you just got to make sure that you beat them. <laughs> yeah. In terms of your first funding uh, with Richard, uh, was it convertible debt? Was it equity? Um, and looking back on it, do you think it was a fair valuation? Yeah, it was equity. And looking back, I think it was an extremely fair valuation. Um, Branson, through the whole thing, has been extremely generous. And I think that a lot of that, all of, all of our investors have been extremely generous, been extremely generous. And I think that a lot of that stems from the fact that all three of the guys that we got going into it, um, both all three, Branson, Alex, and Jerry, um, are guys that, yes, they're in it for the money, right? It's a business at the end of the day. Um, but they're also in it to help see us succeed. And I think that a lot of their thinking was, uh, you know, even if the first thing hadn't gone well, you know, maybe the second or third thing had, and we were kind of a learning, um, you know, if they invested at the beginning and we learned a lot from that, then maybe the next one would go extremely well and we would have learned so much that, you know, two, three, four, five, um, they would make their return. It just happened that the first thing went well and hopefully the next ones do too. Any other things? Yeah. Um, I have a couple of kids and they don't always agree. Um, when you and your brother found places that you didn't agree yeah. on what to do, what happened? Yeah, so one of the things that was good is that growing up with a sibling, you kind of learn about them. So I had 18 years to learn about my brother before we started this business. Um, so. At any point in time, whenever we disagreed on something, and we would be nicely arguing about it, um, it was good that we had this level of we knew how to compromise on things. And knowing each other so well since we had grown up together, I knew the exact times where um, he was lying to me, or you know, <laughs> like, because I could, you know, how you know someone so well, and I'm like, I can see it in your face because I know the way your face works that like you're lying to me, or like you don't actually believe what you're saying, and you're just saying it to prove a point. Um, and so, luckily, my brother and I, when we were discussing these things, could call each other out on those, like, call each other's bluff. Um, so that helped a lot, but a lot of it was just constant communication. So, throughout the entire my social cloud phase. Um, towards the end, uh, my brother and I moved out and got our own apartment um, because we hired 10 people by the time we got acquired and you can't live in an office and have 10 people working there. 
So we moved out, but we also lived together there. And so it was every day after we would come back from the office, um, we would just recap shortly, you know, 10 minutes. What did the day look like? Where, where, if any, are there any problems that we see or anything that we can kind of foresee down the line with any of the employees or the product or the marketing or anything like that? Just making sure that every day we had at least 10 minutes to just say, what's going on and what do we see that might be a problem later on? And not be afraid. I think you got to be honest with each other and trust each other, even if the truth doesn't necessarily always look great. Through looking back on this process, do you think being a woman helped or hurt or was sort of neutral to the whole experience? Yeah, so I think that, I was talking to someone about this earlier, I think that in looking back, there are definitely times it helped and times it hurt. Uh, so times it helped being a young female entrepreneur in tech, um, in terms of getting press and getting people to cover the story, um, certainly helped. Right? Um, there are other times where I was telling someone the story earlier of uh, there were a couple people when I lived in New York that I had gone to conferences to or with and I had learned from them and then I said, you know, I'd love to have you as a mentor of mine. Um, and then when I would call on them saying, you know, I've got some questions about my business, would it be all right if we met after class? Um, so that I could ask you some of these questions, it would always be something where if it was a guy that was a mentor, they would say, no, because you're a girl, I can't meet you after 5 p.m. because it looks bad. Um, and I got a lot of things like that, um, that you know, none of my male peers ever had that. That was never a problem for them, but for me it was. Um, there are also other things where I guess, again, it helped because I had my brother in the room whenever we were going in to VC firms and things like that, but um, sitting down at a table with VCs, um, it's always interesting because not all of them, but some of them for sure, I'm not going to name any names, but you'll sit down in the room and immediately it will be a conversation between that person and my brother and it'll be like I'm on the sideline, um, which is interesting. and I would be interested to see how that played out if my brother wasn't in the room. For every serious funding talk that we had, he'd always been there. Um, but I noticed that I was never really the focal point of that at all. Not that I needed to be, I wanted it to be a shared thing, but it wasn't even that. Um, and then a lot of times, even when my brother would say, you know, Stacy knows more about this, uh, it would be an eye exchange, is she saying, that this is, is what she's saying right. Um, which, something that I notice, and I'm sure a lot of you probably notice if you're in that same situation, and a lot of people, when you call them out on it, don't, um, don't notice it. But it's definitely something that's present. Did you find female mentors through the process to help you? Yeah, so I have a couple female mentors um, that have been good. I don't have a lot of female mentors in tech, though, which is interesting but a lot more about how to ba balance the personal life with the working life. Um, and a lot of females that I talk to about how that works out. Can you talk a little bit about your new startup? Are you seeking to mentor other people, or what is that? Yeah, definitely. With 2 Billion Under 20, or the new startup that I'm doing? or um, So 2 Billion Under 20, um, I'm definitely, yeah, helping give resources and access um, to kids that are 20 and under 20. Um, I also do some mentoring for people that are older than 20. Um, I'm always available by email or Twitter or whatever. I'm pretty good about getting back to people. Um, so that's always good. And then, uh, I don't know, do you want to know about my next startup too or just in regards to mentoring? Uh, so the next thing that I'm working on is an online platform for traditional media companies um, to sell their ad space. So uh, print ad space, television ad space, radio ad space, billboard ad space. Um, just building an online marketplace for them to sell all of that. Okay. Has that been funded yet? It has not. One question. 
Um, if you want to look back in your experience in the school or outside school, can you tell that there's some things that help you that prepare you for being an entrepreneur and running a company this early? Things that helped me. Yeah. My parents. My parents looking back. Um, at the time, I felt like growing up as a teenager, there was a lot of tension with my parents. But looking back, my parents were by far the best uh, parents I ever could have asked for in terms of helping me to be an entrepreneur. Um, they kind of ruled with tough love um, and everything in our household that we wanted, we had to work for. Um, and at the time, it was like, you know, I just want a Hollister jacket. Can you just buy me it? But my parents um, would come back to me and say, no, like, if you want to spend $50 on a jacket, you're going to go out and you're going to work for that money, and you're going to go out and buy it yourself. Um, and little things like that, which at the time annoyed me as a kid, but now looking back um, made me realize that, you know, you got to work for everything that you get. There are no free lunches, no handouts. Um, and so I couldn't be more thankful to my parents for raising me with that mentality. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. And I think even though you know you have done this uh, very short period of time, you have a profound learning. And I was looking at some of the quotes, like, yeah, that's so true. I have to remember that every day. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Japanese cookie. Yeah. <laughs>